So you could basically be walking down the street and a plane would come by with a banner on it with a clue to this, uh, to this puzzle. And if you missed the banner, you were out of, out of the equation. So, uh, but it was part of the game. And then on the leaderboards, people would share the information that they gave. So we used to say, I, got, I started making games at uh, Comic Con last year. And um, the one we recently did was um, called Dalliance on the Queen Mary, and it ran in January, and I've got a short little video to show you. So, uh, here we go. These are all parts of the game and players playing it. There's a steampunk theme. Uh, telegrams, uh, a series of letters between uh, two separate uh, couples that rode on the, um, the ship different ways. And the teams had to um, the teams had to, to decipher what was going on with the dialogues between them and then share the clues, and I'll tell you a little bit about it right after this one. Yeah, it was a lot of fun, and the Queen Mary's amazing. I hope you get a chance to walk around on the decks and kind of see some of uh, what's going on. The horn goes off at certain hours, and it's it's just an immense amount of history in one place. Uh, so I'll go through this. Um, I'll go through this presentation. I timed it to two minutes. And here we go. Do that, and it bonded players in a secretive way. Um, only they knew they were playing the game. One was a ensign badge that was blue, and one was an ensign badge that was white. So if you saw somebody wearing it across the, the, uh, the way, you would say, hey, are you playing the game? Um, the groups only had one half of the puzzle, and they were required to collaborate and share information to unravel the entire story. So they couldn't just play it by themselves to win. So themes and research. So themes in the steampunk community are handcrafted memorabilia, attention to detail, and they're a community of crafters. So in order to bridge the chasm from reality to transmedia, we focused on grassroots, person-to-person -person interaction. 
We created a growing buzz about the game by making invite only, and we had 100 players. 50 had packet A, which was red, and 50 had packet B, which was black. Our goal was to connect on a visceral level, engage at their core, and establish credibility with the ornateness of the story world. Particularly the bills that were used as puzzle pieces. They had to, um, they only got some of the bills and they had to share it with the other teams. Oh my goodness, I'm sorry. I forgot to do this one. Okay, so. So this was the reward they got for solving the postcard. And what would happen is at the end of the game, you find somebody and you complete your part of the postcard, but you only had half of the answers. So teams that completed that mailed it away, and, um, and we gave them a, a new bill. There were five bills total, and a uh, medallion. Like a, the award prize was a um, the blue ribbon, which is what you win when you go from uh, one side of the ocean to the other the fastest. Next steps. So a hidden portion of the bill on the reward has a clue in American Sign Language that leads to the next full story phase at the ultimate duel.com. Our next event is in Costa Mesa in June. Follow the link to find out where. We'd love to see you there. And I have samples of the bills if anybody would like one. Take care. Thank you, Mike. Uh, thank you, Mike. Thank you for bearing with us in our technical difficulties. As Brad Templeton said earlier, AI is easy, AV is hard. Uh, so let's give a uh, round of applause for our AV guys here who are trying to fix this in the moment. Uh, okay, so next up we have Jean Rintoul. She's an engineer and neuroscientist and biofeedback obsessor. Uh, she has worked making brain-computer interfaces and biosignal algorithms. Uh, she is interested in the limits of non-invasive biosensors for physical and mental health. Please give a warm round of applause, Jean Rintoul, Biosensors and You. Um, apparently we have a, a moment to wait for there's a presentation on the screen, but it shouldn't be a moment. Um, so my talk is about biosensors and you. Why on earth would you wear these irritating things strapped to your skin um, for as much time as possible? And why they might change your life and be so important to the future? Um, uh, one of the things I want to talk about is why so far in biosensing and biohacking everybody's focused on the brain and I think that perhaps the best way forward is to focus on the body so that we can learn more about the brain through the body. Um, historically and so far people have spent massive amounts of money on systems like an MRI which costs about three to five million dollars or MEG, magnetoencephalography. Um, which I think costs about 50 million aroundabouts, and is, uh, only in uh, universities you have to spend a lot of money on your education before you even get access to them. Um, and then your standard run of the real EEG system, which might um, go for about 40k for something that you could actually use to publish a paper with. Um, these systems only look at one organ in the body, they only look at the brain. Um, and the brain is very complex. There's only so much you can see with these systems. They're not high enough resolution yet to be able to actually understand the brain. What we can do and what we do understand. Two minutes. Two minutes? Oh, uh, is, uh, is a simple two, two dollar sensor, like a pulse sensor or a, uh, a weight stone bridge, which is galvanic skin response, uh, which is made from like, a couple of resistors and some wire. Um, using very simple sensors, you can detect heart beats, stress, um, EMG, sleep patterns, sleep, uh, respiratory, respiratory rate, maybe blood glucose level. Um, and these, these sensors can actually tell you a lot about your health and well-being. Hopefully uh, we can monitor your physiological state and uh, upload all this information that you've been collecting all the time to a large uh, cloud-based system and then do data analysis on it to understand not just your own health but everybody else's health better as well. Um, next, I want to talk about why the body um, is actually the gateway to the brain. Um, with these simple $2, very cheap sensors, we can learn a lot about the brain. 
um, there's something called the autonomic nervous system, which is what connects the brain to the body. Um, there's a nerve called the vagus nerve, or otherwise known as the wandering nerve, which connects everything together. There's all these different subsystems, and they all send information back into the brain. Um, and some of, some of them actually will have a massive impact on how you feel and your mood every day. To describe this moment or focus on just one subsystem, um, the brain is actually a distributed system. You've got your brain, which is about 100 billion neurons. Your stomach is a, is, has its own uh, nervous system as well. It's called the enteric nervous system. Um, when you are in embryogenesis or before you, um, when you're a fetus, all these nerves were bundled together, and as you um, started to grow, they split off into their different subsystems. Um, you've got your spinal cord, as well as your heart, and they've all got their little subsystems going on. Um, what's interesting about the brain gut sub subsystem is that um, it actually has 90% of your body's serotonin and 50% of your body's dopamine. That means most of the things with the neurotransmitters are actually in your gut, not in your brain. And so these things are distributed around your body your, your, your gut actually affects your mood, um, which answers questions like, why do you get butterflies in your stomach before a performance? Why would indigestion produce uh, nightmares? And why do antidepressants now also uh, affect your gastrointestinal, uh, gastrointestinal ailments? All of these things suggest that your brain and body are very, very much connected and we can learn a lot about our brain by monitoring our body. This is a very cheap way to access our brain, much cheaper than a, an MEG system for $50 million. Um, it would be great if more people got involved. The more people get involved in this movement, the faster uh, we'll be able to come up with uh, better health plans using non-invasive biosensors. I'm actually wearing one now. Um, you can get involved with lots of different groups as BioCurious and SenseBridge, Habit Design and Quantified Self Meetups. Uh, lots of people are talking about these topics at Bill Conference. There's a lot of startups in the area. Um, but altogether, what I wanted to highlight is that the body and brain are connected, and uh, through non invasive biosensing, hopefully, we can start to understand ourselves much better um, and improve our health and longevity. Great, thank you. when the AV equipment melts down, just a little. Uh, but once again, we're going to reintroduce Matt Bell. Uh, I'm sorry? We're at out of time. Oh, Matt. All right. I will make this We will still be meeting here at, at 525 with a shortened break to reconvene. Okay? Here you go, Matt. Take the floor. All right, I apologize for the problems earlier. I, I swear I tried it during the previous break, did the exact same thing, but this time it didn't work. But it worked the third time. So it's a pleasure to come back here and speak again after a year. Uh, last year I gave a talk whose, the, the essential point of the talk was low-cost 3D vision is available, and here's all this awesome stuff that's going to happen. So it's actually really nice to come back a year later and say, hey, all that stuff I said was going to happen a year ago, a lot of it's actually happened. And uh, for this talk, I'm going to drill in on an area I care a lot about, which is reconstructing the world around you in 3D, basically turning the physical world into 3D models. I think I have to move outside the X. It's OK. <laughs> all right, so I'm going to talk about some enabling trends. Uh, first off, models are getting a lot more sophisticated. It used to be that we had maps in our car. Now we have Google Maps with street view and directions and all these details. Secondly, a lot more people are generating content. You know, we're in an age where everyone's taking photos of everything around them. So these are all very non-controversial trends. However, there's a third trend which I mentioned, which is low-cost computer vision, which has shown up in the form of the Kinect. Essentially, Microsoft has sold 18 million Kinects. It's actually an amazing device. It can see the world around it in 3D, and using that, you can essentially get a 3D jigsaw puzzle piece of reality. And if you get a whole bunch of those jigsaw puzzle pieces, you can actually put together a model of reality. 
And this actually solves a really huge problem in the world, which is that although it's easy to go from a 3D model to the physical world, this happens all the time, anyone designs anything, it's very hard to get 3D out of the physical world and back into a computer. The currently available technology for that is something called a laser scanner. Um, an entry level one costs around $50,000. It's so expensive it comes with a four day training session. And at the end you get this like massive cloud of millions of points that you have to buy like a $20,000 piece of software just to look at. So this, this really doesn't work unless you happen to be a very large construction firm. So the alternative you know, if you have some 3D object that you want to work with or take data um, from, is you end up making one of these. And if you've ever remodeled your house or planned to buy furniture at IKEA, you know the pain of essentially documenting the world in 3D. So the exciting change I was talking about earlier, you have this cheap 3D capture hardware, and then you add some really clever computer vision, and you enable everyone to create 3D models. And by everyone, I'm more fun than just looking at videos. So if you want to meet me after the talk around the um, AV desk in the back, we will scan things and it'll be fun. <laughs>